a dar inicio a esta tercera sesión. Buenos días. Eh, y buenos días nuevamente a todos, a todas. Eh, esta sesión... Sí, pero yo ya dije 10 minutos. Pues. Yo ya dije 10 minutos. Está por ahí. Sí, pero es que yo ya estoy con el tiempo. Yo anuncié. Yo anuncié. Voy avanzando con la introducción para ganar tiempo, que se repite cada vez, aunque claro en este caso tenemos un, otra delegación. Eh, esta audiencia está referida al tema del seguimiento e implementación de las obligaciones internacionales de derechos humanos por Canadá y ha sido solicitada por Amnesty International de Canadá, la sección en inglés, la, la coalición canadiense por los derechos de los niños, eh, el Social Rights Advocacy Center, American Team of the Human Rights Law Implementation Project y bienvenidas a las delegaciones y del Estado de Canadá también. Eh, en esta audiencia, cada una de las partes podrá realizar una intervención inicial de hasta 15 minutos. Iré indicando con carteles cuando falten 5, 3 y 1 minutos. Agradeceremos que al momento de hacer uso de la palabra, cada persona se identifique, indicando además la organización o función que cumple. Eh, me acompañan en la mesa comisionado James Cavallaro, que es relator para Canadá, nuestro secretario ejecutivo, Paulo Brown, y la relatora especial para los derechos económicos, sociales, culturales y ambientales, Soledad García Muñoz. Eh, mi nombre es Francisco Iguren, presidente de la Comisión Interamericana, y entonces, hechas todas las especificaciones técnicas, daríamos inicio a esta audiencia con la intervención inicial de la representación de la sociedad civil y organizaciones peticionarias de esta audiencia hasta por 15 minutos. Adelante, por favor. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Buenos días. Uh, good morning, honorable commissioners. I'll proceed in English. I am Paola Limón. I am a senior research officer at the University of Essex in the United Kingdom. Uh, with me at the table are Sheila Day of the Canadian Feminist Alliance for International Action and Bruce Porter of Social Rights Advocacy Center. I'm here on behalf of the Human Rights Law Implementation Project. It's a collaborative project between academic and civil society institutions funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. The project is tracking selected decisions issued by UN treaty monitoring bodies and the regional human rights systems in Europe, Africa, and the Americas, analyzing the extent to which states have complied with them and what hinders or helps implementation. Canada is one of the countries we are looking at, and we started by looking at their engagement with international human rights law. At the regional level, um, it is worth reminding that Canada was a permanent observer of the OAS for 28 years and attained full membership in 1990, um, as such accepting oversight by this honorable commission. Since then, Canada has received recommendations from this commission from two country thematic reports and from two merits reports and two individual cases. At the inter international level, Canada is a party to two-thirds of the core human rights instruments adopted within the United Nations, uh, and as such, it bears periodic reporting, monitoring, uh, periodic reporting duties to most UN treaty monitoring bodies, who in turn formulate recommendations uh, through their concluding observations. Canada has also accepted the inquiry procedure uh, of CAT and CEDA and has already subjected, uh, been subjected to one inquiry. Regarding individual communications, Canada has accepted the individual communications procedure for the Human Rights Committee, CAT, and CEDA, as a result of which it has been found to be in violation or potential violation of its international obligations in 24 cases by the Human Rights Committee, nine decided by CAT, and one decided by CEDA. On most of these uh, cases, the bodies have expressly called upon Canada to take individual and structural measures to remedy the violations found. Since 2002, Canada has also received at least 11 visits by special procedures of the UN, 
who have made recommendations, including on issues related to widespread homelessness and inadequate housing, hunger and food insecurity, systemic racial discrimination, widespread poverty and increasing socioeconomic inequality, and serious human rights issues affecting indigenous peoples, women, migrants, persons with disabilities, and the environment. Canada has further received 330 recommendations from its first and second cycle reviews at the UPR, the Universal Periodic Review. Uh, with this panorama, it is quite evident for us that although Canada could certainly benefit from greater engagement with the inter-American system, it nonetheless already has plenty of international recommendations pending effective implementation at the domestic level. Uh, but what happens in Canada once these decisions and recommendations are handed down? Our first challenge when trying to answer this question was the lack of public information available. We eventually came across the Continuing Committee of Officials on Human Rights, a federal provincial territorial group established in 1975, chaired by the Federal Department of Canadian Heritage, which is similar to a Ministry of Culture, um, with representatives of the Departments of Global Affairs and Justice. The Continuing Committee's mandate includes discussing international human rights instruments for signature or ratification, um, sharing of information, facilitating the preparation of periodic reports and appearances be before UN treaty bodies, and overseeing the implementation of concluding observations and other general human rights recommendations. However, both civil society organizations uh, and UN treaty bodies themselves agree that the continuing committee has not been effective in its implementation role regarding these general recommendations. Further, in relation to our particular study, it is not at all involved in implementing inter, uh, decisions issued in the context of individual cases. Uh, regarding individual communications, it is the Department of Justice that is charged with litigation, follow-up, and implementation, acting as a liaison between global affairs and the relevant provincial, territorial, and or subject matter departments for the specific case. We were informed that an interdepartmental consultation process is held, analyzing the treaty body's reasoning, the facts that it relied on to reach its decision, the recommendations, and domestic law and jurisprudence on the matter. In order to determine whether Canada agrees with the decision, and if so, whether any actions are to be taken to implement the recommendations. Um, however, uh, at no point of this process of individual communications does Canada engage directly with petitioners or representatives, nor does it consult civil society organizations when it comes to structural recommendations. As such, it cannot be said that there is an adequate mechanism or process in place to domestically implement international decisions issued in individual cases. A further concern we encountered was implementation of interim measures. In at least three cases before CAT and two cases before the Human Rights Committee, Canada deported people who were protected by interim measures. In one of them, arguing that the request had been received too late to stop the deportation. In another, given that a domestic court had held that interim measures were not binding. And in the rest, it appears that Canada simply did not agree with the interim request. In other cases where people have not been deported, some have managed to obtain permanent residency, but it has only been because they have been able to afford uh, the costs of filing subsequent domestic applications to obtain that not because of direct government actions aimed at implementing the decisions of the international bodies. Another issue is the use of federalism as a justification for failing to implement recommendations. This arose in one case where the province of, in the province of Ontario where public funding is provided for private Catholic schools but not for other religious denominations. In 1999, the Human Rights Committee determined that Canada should eliminate this discrimination. It didn't specify how it had to do it. Um, however, Canada's response was limited to saying that education fell exclusively under the jurisdiction of the province and that the province had informed that it would not take any measures to implement the Human Rights Committee's decision. In other cases where Canada has taken measures to implement a decision in an individual communication, it has failed to adequately address the underlying systemic issues. For example, in the case of Sandra Lovelace, a Maliset Indian who lost her Indian status for, not marry for marrying a non-Indian man. The Human Rights Committee found that the Indian Act discriminated on the ground of sex. In response, Can uh, Canada reformed the Indian Act in 1985 in a way that restored the petitioner's status but did not fully eliminate sex discrimination. More than 36 years later, after the decision of the Human Rights Committee, these remaining issues of discrimination keep being taken up by UN treaty monitoring bodies in their concluding observations, as well as by this Honorable Commission in its report of missing and murdered Indigenous women, and also in this morning's hearing. Um, 
from our research, it became clear that the ineffective implementation of individual decisions in Canada is part of a broader problem in relation to implementation of international human rights obligations. These broader concerns will be addressed by my colleagues from Canada. Commissioners, <clears throat> my name is Sheila Day. I'm the chair of the Human Rights Committee of the Canadian Feminist Alliance for International Action. As this commission is fully aware, Canada is trying to address a crisis of murders and disappearances of Indigenous women and girls. As your investigation in 2015, after your investigation in 2015, your commission made 10 recommendations to Canada about how to address the violations of rights which are set out in regional human rights instruments. These recommendations have not been implemented. <coughs> Shortly after, the CEDAW committee issued its report under its inquiries procedure with 38 recommendations. Only one of the CEDAW committee's recommendations has been implemented, the establishment of a national inquiry to further investigate the causes of the violence and the steps necessary to prevent and remedy it. The recommendations of this commission and the CEDAW committee are consistent and overlapping. Yet there is no action on these recommendations from expert bodies to fulfill obligations that Canada has agreed to be bound by. Canada stated <coughs> repeatedly that by setting up the National Inquiry, it did not intend to delay action on steps that had already been recommended, and yet that seems to have been the effect. There is no mechanism in place that allows Indigenous women and, and communities and civil society to monitor and assess actions of governments against the recommendations that have been made by this commission and the CEDAW committee. In its 2016 review of Canada, the CEDAW committee recommended precisely such a mechanism so that Indigenous women and the Canadian public can know and hold governments accountable for implementing the changes necessary to stop the violence and fulfill the rights of Indigenous women and their families. The CEDAW committee is waiting for Canada to report back on its implementation of this recommendation, um, which they're committed to doing by July 2018. The inquiry is operating, this is the National Inquiry on Murders and Disappearances, is operating as though its work has no relationship to Canada's human rights framework and obligations. This is a stunning state of affairs when the inquiry started out with the grounding of two strong investigations from both regional and international human rights bodies. Since all levels of government are parties to the inquiry, <clears throat> governments and the inquiry should be exploring cooperative mechanisms for ensuring that the Commission's and CEDAW's recommendations are implemented and monitored. Thank you, Commissioners. My name is Bruce Porter. I'm with the Social Rights Advocacy Centre. As um, Ms. Leon has uh, demonstrated, uh, the UN treaty bodies and Canadian civil society organizations are all agreed that it is, there is simply no effective mechanism in place in Canada for following up on recommendations or concerns from regional and international human rights bodies. In, in the last review of Canada before the Committee on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights, the committee said, quite strongly effective procedures for follow-up on the committee's concluding observations have simply not been developed, and this is after many years of raising that concern. There may be some hope on the horizon. For many years, we in civil society have urged that a political level meeting of federal, provincial, and territorial ministers responsible for human rights be held to address the concerns from everybody from the Senate of uh, Canada through virtually every UN treaty body and throughout civil society about the absence of any kind of effective implementation mechanism. Um, no meeting had been held since 1988, and the good news is that a meeting has now been scheduled for the coming week. 30 representatives of civil society and Indigenous peoples organizations have been invited to participate, and we're hopeful that the ministers will commit to developing over the coming year a new process for transparent, effective, and accountable implementation of Canada's international human rights obligations that will include extensive engagement with provincial and territorial governments, Indigenous peoples organizations, civil society, and community-based organizations, along with, of course, federal and provincial human rights institutions. We believe that a new approach to implementation in Canada must be well coordinated between different levels of government, include necessary decision-making authorities, 
be transparent and publicly accessible, including regular reporting, provide clear oversight role to parliamentarians and provincial territorial legislatures, including public hearings before parliamentary and legislative committees. And I have to emphasize that at the present time, there is simply no engagement of our political bodies with our international human rights obligations. They're not raised in parliament or legislatures. They're just not considered. We have to recognize, of course, the special relationship with Indigenous peoples and representative organizations, including the obligation to obtain their free, prior, and informed consent with respect to matters impacting on their rights. It has to institute a meaningful process of engagement and dialogue with civil society and address systemic discrimination based on race, gender, disability, immigration status, and other grounds. Implementing international human rights obligations, of course, is not restricted to dealing simply with recommendations from international and regional human rights bodies. A central obligation is to ensure access to effective remedies domestically. Canada's failure to ensure access to justice has been of particular concern to uh, treaty bodies. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms has been recognized as the primary vehicle through which Canada gives effect to its international and regional human rights obligations. And yet, as the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights has said, they rarely, if ever, promote interpretations of the broadly framed rights in the Canadian Charter, such as the right to life, security of the person, and equality, in a way which would provide for effective remedies. These interpretations would be consistent with the directions from the Supreme Court of Canada, yet Canadian governments continue to argue in court that commitments to economic, social, and cultural rights should be excluded from charter interpretation, arguing that these issues are beyond the competence and mandate of courts. Even where the evidence is clear that homelessness has resulted in hundreds of deaths on the cold streets of, Can of Canada, the federal and provincial governments have succeeded in convincing courts to deny claimants any evidentiary hearings on the basis that the right to housing, for example, is non-justiciable. The Federal Minister of Justice has committed to reviewing litigation strategies to ensure conformity with Canadian values. We urge that this review include a consideration of Canada's international and regional human rights obligations as core values. It's critical that this review be carried out not only at the federal, but also at the provincial territorial levels. In the context of the hope raised by the interministerial meeting, we respectfully request that this honourable this <coughs> honorable Commission consider engaging more actively in reviewing Canada's mechanisms and procedures for implementing its international human rights obligations. We're appreciative of recent efforts by the Rapporteur for Canada and by the recently appointed Special Rapporteur on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights to engage with Canada about recognizing, for example, the right to adequate housing in recently announced National Housing Strategy and efforts to encourage Canada to ensure access to justice and effective remedies through this strategy. We believe that a more active engagement by the Commission with Canada and with civil society and Indigenous peoples organizations regarding a range of issues related to domestic implement implementation can help to propel a long overdue reform. And in conclusion, just specific requests that would be useful for this Commission to make to Canada in our submission. One would be a report on the outcome of the interministerial meeting in terms of new implementation procedures, a report on plans for the national housing strategy as it is developed in the next year and how it protects the right to adequate housing, and reports on how international human rights obligations will be used in other proposed national strategies with respect to disability rights, anti-poverty initiatives, a food security plan, a national anti-racism plan, and a national gender equality plan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. La señora, la señora embajadora, o, bueno, ok, ok, muy bien. Ahora la, entonces la exposición del Estado. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners, members of civil society organizations and observers. My name is Eugenie Panichaska. I'm the OAS coordinator at the Department of Global Affairs Canada. I would like to thank uh, the Commission for hosting this hearing and the civil society organizations were presented here for um, their proposals for Canadian domestic mechanism to process the outcomes of international human rights treaty bodies in a transparent manner. Canada takes its human rights obligations very seriously and on the international and domestic fronts. Although the recommendations of the ICHR and the UN human rights treaty bodies are not legally binding, Canada considers them very seriously, in good faith, 
as important sources of guidance. We also have mechanisms for discussion of all fund of use and recommendations that are well coordinated within and among responsible levels of government with the objective of responding as needed to all fund of use and recommendations. So internationally, Canada supports the important work of the Inter-American Human Rights Commission and the UN Treaty Right Bodies. Canada does its utmost to cooperate with these bodies at all stages of the individual communications, periodic reporting, and thematic hearing processes. As it was mentioned earlier, and as you know, Canada is a federation. Um, Canada's constitution therefore confers legislative, legislative sorry, and executive powers on two levels of government, federal and provincial territorial. Each level is sovereign in their respective spheres. There is a federal government for all of Canada and a provincial territorial government for each province territory. The government of Canada also recognizes that indigenous self-government is part of Canada's evolving system of cooperative federalism and distinct orders of government. As informed by the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Indigenous Peoples have a unique connection to and constitutionally protected interest in their lands, including decision-making, governance, jurisdiction, legal traditions, and fiscal relations associated with those lands. As it was mentioned uh, earlier, the federal government and um, provincial, uh, the provinces and territories have different jurisdictions. Uh, so the Constitution gives the Parliament of Canada jurisdiction over matters that are national in character, such as immigration and refugee protection policies and enforcement, and gives the provincial and territorial legislatures jurisdiction in matters of a local nature, such as education, health, and social assistance. All levels of government have responsibility to implement international human rights treaties to which Canada is a party in accordance with their constitutional responsibilities. The final views and recommendations of the ICHR and the UN human rights treaty bodies may raise issues with the laws or actions of the federal government or of provincial territory governments, or both. Well-established interdepartmental and intergovernmental consultation and decision-making processes for considering and responding to final views and recommendations are in place to ensure a consistent and principled approach and to enhance the speed and efficiency of decision making. Canada also has many domestic mechanisms and processes in place to monitor and protect human rights in its territory, such as human rights commissions, various administrative bodies and public advocates, and ultimately the courts. That said, we know that there are certain constraints on any domestic mechanism. For example, for the majority of communications, the domestic decisions that prompt the author to make their communication will be confidential. The communications process is also confidential. As well, the communications process is subject to Canada's privacy laws. Any mechanism to consider negative fine of use must respect confidentiality and the author's privacy rights. Canada also engages with civil society in implementing its international human rights obligations, including by meeting with and providing answers to study questionnaires, whether it's from the OAS or the Human Rights Law Implementation Project that was mentioned earlier to which Canada um, contributed. We have listened carefully to the description of possible issues concerning the follow-up to human rights treaty bodies found of use and other recommendations. And we have noted the proposal that Canada establish new mechanisms domestically to respond to, rec to recommendations in negative found of use and to follow up on treaty body recommendations. We will carefully give consideration to these proposals, which will also inform discussions at the upcoming Federal Provincial Territorial Meeting of Ministers responsible for human rights that will take place next week, December 10th to the 12th, as was mentioned. So in conclusion, let me reiterate that Canada takes its international human rights obligations seriously and is committed to maintaining a constructive dialogue with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights which is a vital aspect of a strong and effective international human rights system. Thank you.
Comisionado Cabalaro. Gracias, uh, señor presidente. Uh, let me thank uh, both parties for uh, presentations and the information. Uh, I have a, a, a few general questions. Uh, uh, first, uh, I'm surprised that uh, I did not hear mention of ratification of the American Convention on Human Rights. I imagine that within the realm of uh, measures that could be taken by Canada to strengthen uh, the relevance and applicability of international standards and in particular inter-American human rights standards at the top of the list would be uh, ratification so I would very much welcome the observations of both parties on ratification if there's a path to ratification it, it seems entirely consistent with the direction of this government and it's something that I happen to have had uh, along with uh, uh, colleagues from here uh, the, the pleasure of being at the University of Ottawa in a uh, conference uh, debating and discussing uh, Canadian ratification and uh, the potential obstacles and the benefits, etc. So that's one topic. Uh, second issue, I'd, I'd love to hear more about the uh, uh, follow-up from the inter interministerial meeting and uh, what measures might be taken there in terms of developing some uh, structured and uh, uh, cross ministerial cross governmental level body to ensure coherence in the implementation. I understand how complicated it is to run a government as complex and differentiated as that of Canada. I'm not uh, uh, proposing that this would be an easy task, but it certainly uh, would be uh, useful if, if there were some mechanism for uh, structured implementation of determinations across all governmental levels in Canada of the determinations of uh, international bodies and among them evidently our concern here is with the inter-American system. I'd also like to hear uh, in particular about about the issue of uh, housing. Uh, as you no doubt are aware, the, the Commission very much welcomed uh, including in a press release uh, the determination and, uh, of a housing strategy or the decision that the housing strategy should be guided by the principle of the human right to housing, that that should be a standard, a metric to be used. And I'd love to hear more from both parties about how that could be done, what that would imply, and whether that uh, sort of uh, highly positive approach uh, might be, could be, will be, hopefully applied by the government of Canada in uh, in other areas. And then, in general, uh, you know, across the board, we'd love to uh, receive information about uh, the ways in which Canada is moving towards implementing international decisions, uh, including starting at the beginning with a, with ratification of the American Convention, for instance. Uh, in part because it's important, most importantly, to the people of Canada and the uh, citizens and residents of Canada for their rights to be fully respected, but also because of the uh, leadership role uh, that Canada uh, plays in the hemisphere, uh, one that I think all of us are, are quite quite conscious of. Uh, and, and then the last, uh, if I'm uh, abused, the, the, the few minutes that we have since the government of Canada, the state of Canada, was quite concise in your intervention. Thank you. Uh, just to ask about the, 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 there was uh, one issue in particular, so just on the fact-based presentation here, that's a particular concern are the deportations of individuals despite uh, the determination by an international body that that would not be consistent with Canada's obligations. So among the ways in which Canada uh, can implement decisions, you know, there are different mechanisms that could be designed to promote full compliance with complex recommendations that require changes of policy and changes of institutions. Uh, but there are relatively simple, maybe politically controversial, but relatively simple measures such as not to deport a person when there's a determination not to deport a person. How can that be implemented? as immediately and, uh, and effectively as possible. So those are the questions. Thank you very much for the, for the time, Mr. President.
Gracias, comisionado Cavalaro. Ahora la intervención de la relatora para derechos económicos, sociales, culturales y ambientales. Gracias, eh, señor presidente. Good morning, everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this important hearing. And if you allow me, I, I, I will speak in Spanish <laughs> in order to take advantage of the fabulous <laughs> arrangements we have in terms of interpretation. And yo quisiera eh, sumarme a la inquietud del comisionado Cavallaro por lo que supondría para el sistema interamericano y ni qué decir para el pueblo de Canadá la posibilidad de que Canadá ratifique el Pacto de San José de Costa Rica y con ello también, ojalá, el Protocolo de San Salvador sobre derechos económicos, sociales, culturales y demás instrumentos del sistema. Y en ese sentido me gustaría mucho tener información sobre si hay algún movimiento eh, a nivel del legislativo u otros poderes en Canadá en esa dirección. Por otro lado, también registrar la, la importancia que tiene esta audiencia para la relatoría por ser la primera en la que podemos iniciar a través de este procedimiento tan especial y tan constructivo como son las audiencias temáticas, un diálogo franco y constructivo, insisto, con la sociedad civil y el Estado de Canadá. Recientemente, como señalaba el comisionado eh, Cavallaro, hemos eh, hecho público nuestro apoyo, nuestra eh, bienvenida a la nueva estrategia de Canadá on Housing, una estrategia que esperamos que en su implementación se convierta en un modelo, en una best practice para Canadá y otros países de la región y del mundo. Cuenten con la comisión y con la relatoría en ese sentido y quiero dejar un par de inquietudes sobre la mesa en ese sentido. Por un lado, en lo que hace al acceso a la justicia, que esta estrategia va a favorecería, favorecerá, espero, para las personas eh, homeless o que no, que carecen de una vivienda adecuada. Eh, y por otro lado, yo sé que Canadá, como un Estado federal, enfrenta desafíos también para hacer extensiva esta estrategia a todo su territorio, a todos sus niveles de gobierno. Me gustaría mucho escuchar sobre cómo van a avanzar en ese sentido y volver a ponernos a disposición del Estado y ojalá tener muy pronto la oportunidad de visitar Canadá sobre estos temas y los que se trataron en la audiencia anterior, en la cual lamentablemente no pude estar, aunque sí hice llegar algunas preguntas. Thank you. Thank you very much. And merci beaucoup. Gracias, Soledad. Se transmití tus preguntas que coincidían mucho con algunas de las que ya también había señalado en los temas James, yo mismo. El señor Secretario Ejecutivo, Paulo Brown. Muchas gracias, señor Presidente. Mis saludos a la representación de la sociedad civil, la representación estatal. Apenas aprovechar la oportunidad para registrar la importancia que, que la temática de esta audiencia pública representa para nosotros, la Comisión Interamericana en el marco de su nuevo plan estratégico ha creado hace tres meses una nueva sección sobre seguimiento y cumplimiento de recomendaciones, lo que indica una prioridad para su actuación para el próximo periodo y que tiene un doble eh, propósito, una, una doble, un doble objetivo. Un primer, de perfeccionar las propias prácticas de la Comisión en materia de seguimiento, generando eh, sistemas, bases de información, prácticas y también eh, posibilidades de coordinación con otros mecanismos regionales, subregionales y ya existentes también en el sistema universal. Y un segundo objetivo de apoyar eh, en el desarrollo de los mecanismos nacionales de seguimiento de las articulaciones interinstitucionales, de, bueno, de las prácticas posibles en materia de seguimiento, con el objetivo obviamente de, de reforzar las posiciones de la sociedad civil, pero también de fortalecer las capacidades eh, de, lo, de los propios actores estatales en, eh, en, en materia de cumplimiento de recomendaciones internacionales. Así que para nosotros sería eh, de muy 
buen, buen gusto eh, recibir de la parte de la sociedad civil del estado eventuales sugerencias para el diseño final de esta nueva sección y ideas para alcanzar los objetivos que están propuestos eh, institucionalmente por la, para la CDH en 2018. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Pablo. Eh, yo solamente un par de comentarios. El primero, sumarme a lo que ya han dicho mis colegas, eh, la Comisión valora mucho el esfuerzo que a nuestro a, organismo otorga Canadá y por eso tenemos esperanza que muy pronto creemos que sería un signo muy importante de respaldo a nuestra organización y, y su trabajo y al sistema que un gobierno progresista como el que tiene pues ratificar a la Convención Americana y el sometimiento a la jurisdicción de la Corte. Creo que sería un avance importante y que por lo demás sería beneficioso tanto para el sistema como para Canadá. Y, y solamente quiero hacer una pregunta puntual, aprovechando, eh, sería dirigida a la representación de la sociedad civil, aprovechando un comentario que se hizo, quisiera conocer... Eh, una, un comentario, una evaluación sobre el funcionamiento de la consulta previa a los pueblos indígenas en Canadá. Se la dirigiría a la sociedad civil. Bien, entonces eh, podríamos otorgar la palabra a cada una de las partes hasta por siete minutos. Muchas gracias. Uh, thank you very much. I, just, I would only like to take uh, one minute. We did have, in fact, as the representative of the state mentioned, participation by some Canadian authorities in our project, and we are very appreciative of that. And we would like to have a bit more cooperation, perhaps, for, from certain authorities that we have not been able to speak to. Um, but we do appreciate the, the collaboration. Canada, the reason why, one of the reasons Canada was selected for our project was its status of ratification. Uh, regarding the inter-American system. So we will eventually, we, we still have one year in our project, so we will eventually address uh, recommendations to all involved parties uh, in that regard. Um, but I also think, and as has been mentioned, Canada is a country that many people, many countries in Latin America look up to. They lead, lead um, it's, they are one of the leaders in the region and they look up to it. But I think in terms of implementation, as a preliminary observation, from our project and our research so far, it would also be good for Canada to look at the implementation experiences in Latin America. There are other countries that have that are federal in nature, um, and there are other mechanisms that they're not perfect, but they have a few things that can help to the Canadian experience in terms of accountability, of access to information, of transparency. Um, and regarding a, a comment that was made, and that is also big part of our research is the integral aspect of this implementation because you can see the overlap between the cases and between the non-contentious mechanisms and you can see the overlap between the work of the regional system and the international system. So we think that it is very important and that approach is kept in mind. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just going to respond to a couple of um, points that were made and questions asked. Uh, regarding ratification of the American Convention, I am very strongly of the view that Canada should ratify the American Convention and the San Salvador Protocol and the Convention of Belém do Pera. Um, I will undertake personally, we all go home with homework, <laughs> um, I will undertake personally to go back to my organization and work on um, recommendations regarding that, um, having had the experience that our organization has had with the Inter-American Commission, which has been so helpful. Um, I will, um, I undertake to work on it. Um, I want to say something about cross-jurisdictional mechanisms. I can't tell you how important this is for federal and provincial and territorial governments to actually be in collaborative relationships about the implementation of rights um, we find ourselves blocked over and over again um, by the siloing of jurisdiction and the lack of collaboration and cooperation among levels of government. The fact of the matter is that although um, um, the state party often says the you know, they have different jurisdictions, that's true. They also have a great deal of overlapping jurisdiction and overlapping authority. Um, and the federal government, frankly, has many tools in its toolkit that allow it to, in fact, 
create collaborative and cooperative uh, mechanisms and forums and ways of governments working together. We think that those have been um, not sufficiently used as mechanisms to implement human rights obligations. Um, I want to talk just briefly, um, perhaps per um, personally, to Soledad and her new special rapporteurship. Um, uh, and I go back to the thing that we've been talking about today and that the Commission is already engaged in, which is the question of the murders and disappearances of Indigenous women and girls. One of the things that this Commission has said to Canada, and the CEDAW Committee has also said to Canada, is you cannot end this crisis unless you deal with the social and economic conditions of the women. You have to have a strategy for dealing specifically with their very um, poor um, uh, social and economic conditions. So you have to go at this and you have to have a national strategy that involves all levels of government to do it effectively. Thank you very much. Um, on the question of ratification, I would echo what Sheila said, that I, I working in economic and social cultural rights internationally, I work with lots of Latin American colleagues, and I, I think the biggest uh, message that I take back to Canada is if only Canadian governments and Canadian courts would be willing to recognize how much they could learn from Latin American countries. Um, when my colleagues read decisions from Canadian courts, they are shocked at the narrow notion they have of remedies. And so, for example, and we tell them you've got to um, you know, if we could get our Canadian courts to read some of the decisions of the Colombian Constitutional Court, for example, um, I think they would be able to learn a lot. So we're very hopeful for a much more constructive interaction between um, Latin American countries and the inter-American system generally and in Canada, and particularly around that issue of social and economic rights and access to justice. Um, and just on that point, the, the point was raised um, about uh, the, the uh, views of treaty bodies not being legally binding. And this is something that we hear constantly when we're in court. And um, although formally it's true, we would urge that Canada take a slightly different approach to that. And I, I really would like to men, uh, emphasize that the Canadian system that gets thought of as dualist really is a bit difficult for some civil, um, civil law uh, countries to really comprehend the importance of interpretation for us. That the, Canada doesn't just say we're dualist. We say that we're implementing these obligations through our own law, and our law will be applied and interpreted in light of our international human rights obligations. And so what we would want Canadian governments to be saying in court is, of course, these have significant legal import. If, if our obligation under international human rights law is to ensure access to housing, then if we're looking at whether the right to security of the person or the right to life should be interpreted as including some kind of obligation on governments to make sure that people are not dying on the cold streets of Canada, then surely we want to urge that kind of interpretation on the courts. And instead of that, what we're seeing is Canadian governments are going and saying, no, no, we, haven't, we don't consider the right to housing justiciable, and whatever the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights says, that's not legally binding. So they're going to, rather than using international systems to ensure access to justice, they're reading all of this stuff out of the protections that could be interpreted quite differently. And for people that I work with living in homelessness and poverty in Canada, this issue of being included in the interpretation of fundamental rights, like the right to life, is absolutely critical. It means equal citizenship. It means being valued as a human being. And in the Canadian context, we could really benefit from a more constructive interaction between some of the interpretations that are being developed here uh, around the right to life, the right to a dignified life. These are the kinds of things that Canada could really benefit from, I think. Um, and in terms of the national housing strategy and how it engages with the provincial territory governments. This is the critical area where Canada has to move forward. And as Sheila mentioned, international human rights obligations can provide the framework for a really creative model of federalism. If you were to go to Quebec and say, we want the federal government to uh, develop all the rules about access to housing and we're gonna impose them on you, then Quebec would be, would be quite offended. But if you said to Quebec, you know, we've all signed on to the covenant on economic, social and cultural rights and we're all, part of these international human rights obligations, and we'd like to frame our joint obligations around our shared international human rights obligations. That has ended up playing out much better 
and in fact, Quebec signed, you know, the, even uh, the Bloc Québécois signed on to a proposed national housing strategy. So this is the kind of thing that we think that could be done much more creatively and a national housing strategy is a great example where the provinces and territories could be asked to buy into the very same framework of rights. It obliges all levels of government to comply and then we could have parallel commitments and recognition of the, of, the, of the need to work jointly. So we, and we really welcome, and as I mentioned, the um, involvement of the new Special Rapporteur uh, in working with Canada on that. Thank you very much. La palabra para el Estado, por favor. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to the petitioners this morning for bringing this issue forward. Um, government, good government relies on an active and engaged citizenry that is constantly vigilant, that is asking difficult questions, and is requiring the government to be accountable, transparent, and engaged. So the work that we heard from the first petitioner is very welcome to the Government of Canada. If you can provide uh, information on your study, I'm sure we'd be very pleased to follow it and to see what we can do to address some of the concerns that are raised. Um, I would also like to say, I, I want to react a little bit, although it wasn't part of the original petition. Um, the, the comments that have been made about uh, acceding to the Inter-American Human Rights Convention. Um, there are a range of views on this in Canada, within government and outside government as well. But it is true uh, that the convention was developed before Canada became a member of the OAS and in a very different environment and context. It was also developed before the Charter of Rights and Freedoms uh, were put in place, which is the document that governs human rights in Canada. There are a range of views on the consistency that exists between these two documents. Some who believe that a seating would be possible, some who have a different view, but nonetheless it is not something that the Government of Canada will do, will undertake lightly. Uh, we've often heard it said that it's possible to apply reservations, but I would simply like to put forward that that is not ideal by any means. Introducing the idea that reservations to human rights conventions are acceptable opens the doorway to a lot of responses to human rights mechanisms and tools that the Government of Canada would not want to support. So we need to take a very careful and thoughtful approach to this issue. I would point out, though, that lack of accession to the treaty does not block our full membership or participation in the Commission, and today is an example of that. Uh, Canada welcomes the scrutiny of the Commission, the advice of the Commission, its wisdom. Uh, we engage actively, and uh, we intend to continue to do so, and our status with respect to the Convention uh, is not a factor in that membership or that participation. Finally, I would say that, that um, uh, again, we are in a new context in a lot of ways uh, in Canada. Uh, consideration is being given to a range of international instruments and reconsideration to instruments that Canada is also part of. Noting in particular, uh, for example, Belém du Pará, uh, which might be something that uh, could be considered again within the Canadian context. Um, this is the work of, of uh, not the work of a week or overnight, it's something that's undertaken in, in, in a careful and considered sense, but I will say that Canada is very committed to its international human rights uh, commitments. We also do share the view that Canada is and should be a leader. And if there are ways that what we have to bring to the table can be helpful, we welcome those. I'm very interested in the remarks that were made about what Canada can learn from the inter-American community because certainly we share that view as well. The OAS is a wonderful environment within which we can uh, share best practices and learn from each other. And I hope that Canada can, can continue to engage actively in that and perhaps draw more from this process. We're a relatively new member in this environment, but one of the OAS's strengths is its ability to support and advance uh, legal cooperation uh, within the Americas, and hopefully we can, we can draw more from that. Questions related to deportation, I would simply note that our next hearing will focus on those issues, and, and it may be a moment uh, where we can answer some of the questions that were raised. It's an extremely complex area of Canadian and international law, and I do not want to wade into that. It, um, it's certainly not my expertise. I will commit to providing whatever information the Commission may need. Uh, and certainly the same applies for the National Housing Strategy. We'd be happy to ensure that the Commission has what it needs to take careful looks at those issues. I would close by saying that we share the optimism uh, that was expressed earlier with respect to the forthcoming meeting of ministers responsible, the provincial and territorial and federal ministers responsible for human rights. This is a wonderful um, initiative. It isn't new, but it's, I suppose, being reinvigorated. Um, we're extremely um, optimistic and hopeful that we can start an effective and useful conversation and that, as, as I think Sheila points out quite well, take advantage of the mechanisms that exist, the flexibility within the federal government, taking note of and respecting the jurisdictions of territories and provinces, as well as uh, indigenous governments, and find a way that, that all Canadians can have access to their rights, 
the way the government can, of Canada can best support and endorse that uh, in a way that recognizes the different rights and jurisdictions and capacities of, of levels of government. Those things should not be barriers to rights. They should be ways to better enable access to rights. The idea behind the differentiation of power is so that those who are closer to the implementation can, can affect its, its implementation best, and that higher level federal positions can be taken on the sort of broadly shared human rights goals and objectives. So, so I suppose it's our commitment to doing that, making sure the system functions the way that it should. But a consultation, uh, active engagement is part of that. This event uh, does involve the participation of civil society, but I'd like to say that these kinds of events as well are part of that ongoing conversation. Every government, not just Canada, requires a robust, active, well-supported, listened to and respected civil society. Uh, and I'm very glad to see you here today and pleased to be able to, to hear what you have to say. And I'm very happy to offer my commitment to take back what we've heard today to the government of Canada so that we can continue in our, our shared project. So thank you uh, very much. And also, I just want to say, Keen, for the support of the commissioners as well. Um, we recognize your expertise, and uh, we hope that we can, we can learn from it as well. So thank you very much. Sí, el comisionado Cavallaro quiere hacer un comentario. Uh, thank you quite, uh, quickly, and I'll abuse the fact that it's my last day in, in this setting. Uh, to, uh, just to raise, uh, uh, as you take information back, to Ottawa. Uh, two things, and, and it's certainly true that the Commission precedes the Canadian Charter, uh, and there are some differences. Uh, I would just uh, flag, and I'm sure you're aware that these issues have been studied. The Standing Committee on Human Rights uh, of the Senate did make a recommendation in favor of, of ratification. Uh, there were five issues that were highlighted. Uh, and if anything, over the past, I think it was in 2003, but I could be wrong, in the past 14 years, uh, the interpretation of the American Convention has moved f uh, towards uh, consistency with Canadian principles and Canadian norms. Uh, I think there really is very little uh, in terms of substantive difference on the issue of, for instance, of women's reproductive rights. Uh, determinations by the Court and the Commission have uh, made clear that those are, are not blocked <coughs> by any potential interpretation of, of Article 4, which is one of the concerns. There are other concerns that have been responded to, but what I would say is that, that uh, perhaps the best way of ensuring that the evolutive interpretation of the Convention, which is a principle enshrined in the Convention itself, and which has been the practice of the intermarket system uh, since its, its creation, the best way to ensure that and that it's done in a way that's consistent with common law principles and with Canadian principles and with the Canadian charters by f with full participation of Canadian experts in this body and in the uh, Inter-American Court. And in the latter, that is only possible through uh, ratification to be able to vote. Uh, but of course, I think uh, Canadian candidates would be certainly welcome in, in that process. Uh, uh, thank you very much for allowing me to uh, abuse uh, my position here. Gracias, James. Bueno, eh, reiteramos nuestro agradecimiento, delegación del Estado, presidida por la señora embajadora, la representación de la sociedad civil. Concluimos esta audiencia y iniciaríamos la, la última, digamos, en 15 minutos. Gracias.